Number theory and cryptography, a field that combines the essence of prime numbers with ciphered messages. It is a mathematical application that surrounds us in our everyday lives. But did you know that it would be impossible without these four main steps? So tell me, when did it all start? I assume it wasn't with prime numbers right away. The use of cryptographic techniques can be traced back to ancient civilizations. But yes, without prime numbers, for now. Could you give me some examples? There are countless examples from all kinds of civilizations. The Spartans used a cryptographic device during the 5th century BC, which involved a cylindrical stick around which a piece of parchment was wrapped. The message was written across the parchment while it was in the cylinder, just like this. When unwrapped, this parchment showed a sequence of letters that appeared to be meaningless, unless wrapped around a cylinder of the exact diameter. During the Renaissance, cryptographic techniques advanced significantly, and this came from many different cryptographers. Blaise de Wagener developed the Wagener cipher in the 16th century. The sender and receiver agree upon a keyword, and this keyword is not written down or communicated openly. Let's assume that this keyword is key. The plain text message, which is to be encrypted, is written out. For example, hello. The key is repeated so that it's aligned with each letter of the plain text. For the plain text hello, the key alignment would look like this. Each letter in the plain text is shifted forward in the alphabet by a number of places equal to the position of the corresponding letter in the keyword. For example, the first letter H, which is the seventh letter in the alphabet, encrypted with K, would be shifted forward by 10 positions, switching with R. Since the shifting pattern is not consistent across the message, because of the repeating key phrase, it's a lot harder to decipher. So here's how the entire message would be encrypted. We switch E with I, L with J, L with T, and O with W, creating the final encrypted message R-I-J-T-W instead of hello. Whoa, how cool. And where do prime numbers come in? Like, when did it become a lot more mathematical? The use of prime numbers in cryptography began with the development of public key cryptography in the 1970s. And there were two key moments. The first was the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange in 1976, proposed by Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman. Let me explain how it works. The names used in cryptography would usually be Alice and Bob, but we'll change it to, I don't know, Sophia and I. Say both parties agree on two numbers, a prime number, say 23, and a base number, say 5. These numbers don't need to be secret. Sophia chooses a secret number, say 6. I choose a secret number, like 15. Sophia used the agreed upon base G equals 5 and modulus P equals 23. And she calculates her public key g to the power of a, module p, or 5 to the power of 6, module 23. Computing 5 to the power of 6 gives 15,625. Then, 15,625 module 23 results in 8. So Sophia's public key is 8. I take my private key, 15. I use the same base, modulus p equals 23, and g equals 5. I calculate my public key L, G to the power of B, module P, or 5 to the power of 15, module 23. Computing 5 to the power of 15 gives this huge number here. And then this number, module 23, results in 19. So my public key L is 19. If you guys are enjoying this video, please like and subscribe. Now, say we share the code with each other. Sophia sends me 8, and I send her L, which is 19. Sophia receives L and computes it as N equals L to the power of A module P or 19 to the power of 6 module 23. Computing 19 to the power of 6 gives this number and this number module 23 results in 2. Sophia finds the shared secret key N to be 2. Then I receive the number S from Sophia and compute it. N equals S to the power of B module P or A to the power of 15 module 23. Computing 8 to the power of 15 gives a very large number, and taking this number, module 23, also results in 2. I find the shared secret key N to be 2. Thus, both Sophia and I arrive at the same shared secret key N equals 2, independently. 
This process of figuring out the secret number is known as solving the discrete logarithm problem, which is difficult to do quickly, especially when we have large numbers. Soon after the Diffie-Hellman breakthrough, Ron Brivest, Adi Shamir, and Leonard Edelman introduced the RSA algorithm. What's the difference between the two? Diffie-Hellman creates a shared secret key which is used to encrypt communication, while the RSA encrypts data and verifies digital signatures. So Sophia picks two prime numbers, let's say P equals 3 and Q equals 11. Sophia multiplies these two primes together to get a number called N, 3 times 11, 33. Sophia calculates the totient phi of N, which for us is 3 minus 1 times 11 minus 1, or 20. She picks a number called E, or a public exponent, that is less than n and relatively prime to phi of n, say, e equals 7. Using e and phi, Sophia calculates her private key d, a number that, when multiplied by e, module phi equals 1. For example, d equals 3, because 3 times 7 is 21, and 21 module 20 is 1. So the public key is the pair e n, and as we've calculated earlier, it is 733. I want to send Sophia a message, which is a number smaller than 33. Let's say the message is m equals 2. I encrypt it by computing c equals m to the power of e module n, which in our case is 2 to the power of 7 module 33. 2 to the power of 7 is 128. Then we have 128 module 33, which equals 29. And the encrypted message is this. 29. Remember, Sophia's private key is 3. Using that, she can decrypt the message I sent her, 29 in this case. Use m equals c to the power of d, module n, or m equals 29 to the power of 3, module 33, which is 24,389. Then this number, module 33, is 2. So the decrypted message is 2. And no one else can decrypt the message without Sophia's private key. Of course, in real-world applications, the prime numbers that are used are very large, hundreds of digits. This is to guarantee security. Remember, the RSA is more like encrypting data and certifying digital signatures. And what's the deal with prime numbers? Why do we have to use them specifically? Why not just any number in general? Because of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which says that every integer greater than one is either a prime number itself or can be made one by multiplying prime numbers together. Every number can be factored into primes in exactly one way, ignoring the order of the factors. Multiplying two prime numbers is straightforward and quick. But factoring their products, so the other way around, it's known to be very hard. And this asymmetry provides security. In other words, it's easy to generate a key, but it's very hard to break it. And do we still use RSA encryption today? Or is there something newer? We still use RSA encryption today, but there are other advancements, of course. And one of the most important is elliptic curve cryptography. It was introduced in 1985 by Neil Koblitz and Victor Miller, who independently suggested its use. Elliptic curves are algebraic structures defined by a type of cubic equation in two variables, typically expressed as y to the power of 2 equals x to the power of 3 plus ax plus b. For those who don't know, I give some private class on math and physics. So if you need some help or if you know somebody, please let me know, okay? You have my contact in the description below. Now, let's go back to the video. And these curves have unique properties. Points on an elliptic curve can be added together, where the sum of two points is defined geometrically. An elliptic curve over a finite field, like integers module a prime, contains a finite but large number of points, providing a rich structure for cryptographic operations. Elliptic curves offer the same level of cryptographic strength as RSA, but with much smaller key size. Let's take Sophia and I again. We decide to use a simple elliptic curve equation, like y to the power of 2 equals x to the power of 3 plus x plus 1, over a finite field f23. We agree to use a base point on this curve, say g equals 310, for generating keys. Sophia chooses a private number, say 4. She computes her public key by adding the point G to itself four times, often done through efficient doubling methods. We're not going to go through the calculations because it's long and complicated, but let's just say for convenience this results in the point 12, 5. 
Sophia sends her public key 12.5 to me. I pick a private number, say 3. I compute the shared secret by adding 12.5 to itself 3 times, which will simply be 9.17. I use this point 9.17 to encrypt a message and then send it to Sophia. Sophia uses her private key to compute the shared secret from the public key I used which should result in the same point, 917. Then she uses this point to decrypt my message. Like I said, elliptic curves achieve the same level of security as RSA, but with much smaller key size. And this means that it uses less computational resources, like memory and processing power. Complicated stuff, huh? For sure. But if you'd like to know more about its foundation, which is number theory, check out this video right here. I'm pretty sure you're gonna like it.